Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The morning cometh, and also the night. If you'll inquire, inquire ye. Jean Lockhart as the Watchman, an observer of the large and the small, the story, the dream, and the prayer of all these many things which men call life. Each week at this hour, the watchman approaches the street lamp on the corner, pauses in his appointed rounds, and smiling a little, remarks somewhat in this manner. This is Jean Lockhart. It's a nice night. You can see one or two clouds, drifting low, reaching down for the steeple over on the church. And there's a kind of a breeze, a, a soft breeze. Almost feels as though it might be left over from spring. Of course, the ring around the moon's supposed to mean rain, but a little moisture will come in handy right now. Wet down the ballpark for the game tomorrow evening. <laughs> Northbound's about three minutes late. Guess it won't make much difference, though. Charlie Thompson's engineering this run. He'll be able to catch up that lost time before he gets the next station. <laughs> Trains, buses, and airplanes, they, they think they can win the race against the minute hand. How do they do that? Catch up time. Hmm. Always seem to me that once a minute's gone, it's gone. Well, I guess that's about all that's going on right now. If you were to ask me, I'd say that, generally speaking, all's well with this night. That's the conclusion I've reached from watching it. You know, it's a funny thing, but we're all watchmen of the night in one way or another. I suppose the young folks may look at the night a little more closely and spend a little more time doing it, but the moon's bigger when you're 17 than when you're 70. That's a fact, even if the scientists won't admit it. And the stars, well, they may get caught in the hair of a high school girl, but they stay a whole lot farther away from an older woman. Still, the youngsters haven't any monopoly on moonlight and stardust. They can blind us all. And sometimes, as our eyes get weaker, the moonlight gets stronger, if you know what I mean. Anyway, young or old, there's always a kind of fascination in watching the night. And there's dreaming. I don't mean the dreams you have when you're asleep. I mean the important dream. The things you always plan on doing. One fella, he may look at the stars and think about finding a way of curing disease. And when that dream comes true, we get radium or penicillin. Another person, well, the moon seems to promise that a great play or a great novel will be written someday. After all, it's pretty much the same moon to look down on Shakespeare or Dickens. Yes, sir. Night's the time when we all have our important dreams. For each of us, there's that one specific goal. Maybe you'd call it a, a life dream. It's the thing that keeps a heart beating or keeps a mind thinking or keeps a hand busy. Of course, a lot of these life dreams don't come true, but when they do, something good happens to the world. Now, you take Tom Hatcher, for instance. He had a life dream... Let's see, if he's still alive, he'd be 98 or 99 years old. Most folks don't come that close to the century mark, so I expect Tom's watching these same stars from another point of view. He was a peculiar little fellow, used to deliver the mail. And somehow, Tom always knew what every letter said inside. Oh, he didn't, he didn't read them or hold them up to the light or anything like that. But he could tell if it was good news or somebody's aunt was sick or just a piece of literature from a mail order house. And he took it for granted that he should, like it was part of his job. Well, Tom's life dream was a gold watch, but he never told anybody about it. No, sir, never mentioned the watch. Yet, it was the most important thing in the world to him. You see, Tom's folks died when he was just a few years old. His mother first, and then his father. And then when Tom was about seven or eight, it began to bother him that he couldn't remember what his father and mother looked like. So he went around to everybody who'd known his folks and asked them what color hair his mother had, and just how she wore it. And if his father's eyes were deep blue or light blue, and did he smile real often, or was he kind of stern and severe? Well, I guess most of the people tried to answer as best they could, but after a time, they got tired of the same questions. And then all of a sudden, Tom stopped bothering folks. And they figured he'd realized what they thought and decided to forget about his parents. But that wasn't it at all. He'd remembered. Yes, sir, Tom had remembered. Not his parents' faces exactly, nor how they looked. Tom had remembered something about them. And it was something no one had told him. Just a little memory and stayed buried way back in his mind and suddenly leaped forward into consciousness. It was a picture of a large gold watch. 
It belonged to Tom's father. Tom could still see it, hanging there from the heavy gold links twirling in front of his eyes. Or he could hear the steady click as his father wound it every evening when he walked up towards the bedroom at nine o'clock. Well, once Tom had remembered that watch, he was satisfied. At any rate, almost satisfied. Because now he had a memory that tied him to his father and his mother, see? A memory that gave him parents, made him seem just a little bit less of an orphan. I guess it was about that time that Tom decided he was going to have a watch like the one his father had carried. At first, he figured maybe he could find the same watch. Should have been given to him, you know, after his father died, but nobody thought about it then, and nobody knew where it was now. So Tom made up his mind that he'd have one that looked just like his father's. And all through his life, he kept trying to buy that watch. <laughs> have you ever noticed that the things you want when you're a kid, you always want? When you're older and start to want something, getting it just doesn't seem so important. But the things you dream about as a kid, oh, they stay with you. And it sort of sticks in your throat if you don't get them. Well, that's how it was with Tom and the gold watch. He never forgot it, and he never stopped trying to buy it. Well, he didn't get the chance to save up any money, not while he was going to school, but as soon as he'd finished the eighth grade, he started working for the post office. As the years went by, he managed to save a little bit every month. It wasn't much, just a few cents at a time, but when Tom was about 30, he almost had the right amount. But he didn't get the watch, because about then Tom had that spell of sickness, some kind of fever it was. Oh, he got over it in a month or so and seemed pretty much like himself again, except that he was a little slower with the mail and wasn't quite as young as he'd been a few weeks before. Of course, we thought that that was because of the sickness, but I imagine it was more likely because he'd had to spend the money he'd been saving for that watch. And after that, it took him a little longer to build up a surplus. I have to admit, though, <laughs> some of the delay was Tom's own fault. Remember that young Johnson girl? <laughs> Tom spent quite a bit of money courting her. We all knew that she would no intention of marrying a man ten years older than she was. No, sir, we weren't a bit surprised when she eloped with that Wilton boy. <laughs> and I don't think Tom was much surprised either. If he was, he didn't show it. He just went right on carrying the mail and trying to save up enough to buy that gold watch. Then one morning, he woke up and looked in the mirror, and an old man looked back at him. Well, as far as Tom was concerned, it was quite a sudden change. Of course, the rest of us, we knew Tom was getting older, and his hair was pretty white by now. And his face was as wrinkled as some of those letters he carried. But Tom hadn't realized the time was catching up with him. He stood there staring into the looking glass for a minute or so. And then he shrugged and smiled and told himself he could work for a couple more years, buy the gold watch, retire, and live on the government pension. Well, for the first time in his life, things worked out the way he planned. Two years later, Tom had saved up $25. And Fogarty's jewelry store had a gold-plated watch that just cost $25. Tom wasn't sure it was as big as his father's, and he sort of remembered that his father's timepiece had been pure gold, at least that's what he thought it was, but the watch in Fogarty's window seemed a mighty satisfactory substitute. I think it was a Saturday night when he went down to buy it. Mr. Fogarty was waiting on another customer, that fellow Bob Carter, and at first he thought Tom had brought a special delivery. Tom shook his head and said, no hurry, I'll wait, I, I want to buy something. Well, since Mr. Fogarty had never sold Tom anything before, he was a little curious. He was trying to get rid of the Carter boy who was looking at some wedding rings. You remember Bob Carter? He's married now. He has three children and a good job with some engineering company out west. Well, Bob, Mr. Fogarty said, make up your mind. And Bob said, whoa, I know what I want, Mr. Fogarty. I, I mean, that is, I, I know what Sue wants. That one there, that, that ring right there in the third row, it's $75, isn't it? Mr. Fogarty tapped the counter and said, you know very well it's $75. You've been in three times already today. Seventy-five then, seventy-five now. It's not going to get any cheaper by you asking about it. Well, the Carter boy was a little embarrassed. He had always been kind of shy, but this time he spoke right up and said what he was thinking. He said, Mr. Fogarty, I just can't afford that ring. I've only got fifty dollars to spend, no more. But Sue, she, well, she's got her heart set on that particular one. Oh, I know she says it don't make any difference, but it does. I want her to have it. I'll pay you that extra 25 after the wedding, you know, a little at a time, or however you say, but I do want that ring. Mr. Horridy, he, he hesitated for, for a minute before he answered. Said, I, I don't know why he turned Bob down. Maybe business hadn't been so good, or maybe Mr. Horridy had eaten something for supper that didn't agree with him. Almost any little thing can make a man do something he shouldn't. Anyway, Mr. Horridy refused to sell Bob the ring, unless he had the full price. Now, during all this, I couldn't say what was going on in Tom's mind, but he just walked up to Bob and said, Bob, here, take this. 
I was going to buy you a wedding present anyway. Now, that's what I come in here for. Better for you and Sue to have something you really want. Well, <laughs> that's all there was to it. Oh, sure, Bob must have guessed that Tom hadn't really intended buying him anything. Certainly hadn't intended spending $25. But Tom sounded awful sincere. And it's so easy to believe something when you want to believe it. So Bob took the money. Well, the next day, Tom realized that he wouldn't be able to get his gold watch. Not ever. You see, he knew he was too old to work much longer, and there wouldn't be time to save up the money all over again. No, sir, that $25 was his last chance for the watch. So there wasn't any point putting off the retirement. No reason to go on working. Well, it was about two weeks later that Tom delivered his last batch of mail. For some reason, most of the letters that day were good news. And I think that that kind of pleased Tom. Back at the post office, they'd planned a little celebration. It was a bit awkward because nobody knew how Tom would feel about a party. Maybe he'd resent it. But no, couldn't be sure. But the folks he'd worked with wanted to do something nice for him. And just as the party was breaking up, they gave Tom the present to mark his retirement. Well, I don't know what had, what had made them decide to buy a gold watch. It's quite a bit like the one that at his window, except that it was a little larger and pure gold. Tom didn't really cry when he opened the case. He said that the gold was so bright it kind of dazzled him. His eyes weren't used to such luster. And we all believed that that was the reason his cheek was wet and his lips trembled. At least we said we believed it. <laughs> well, that's what I remember about Tom Hatcher. I guess you'd say his life dream came true. Maybe the gold watch wasn't so important. Maybe the world wasn't any different because Tom got it. But I kind of like to think it was. And what about that dream you had when you were 16 or 17? Hmm? Hang on to it. But then you couldn't lose it if you wanted it, could you? Hmm? Say, the time's been slipping by. All sorts of things been going on we've missed while I've been standing here talking. But then night's the time for talking to your friends, to the people you love, even to your God. Yes, sir, night's the time for talking. Well, I better get on with my rounds. This is Gene Lockhart, the watchman, hoping that all's well with your night. Listen each week at this hour and over this same station for Gene Lockhart as the watchman. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The morning cometh, and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye. Jean Lockhart, as the watchman, an observer of the large and the small, the story, the dream, and the prayer of all these many things which men call life. Each week at this hour, the watchman approaches the street lamp on the corner, pauses in his appointed rounds, and smiling a little, remarks somewhat in this manner. This is Gene Lockhart. It's a quiet night, isn't it? Of course, if you listen real close, you can hear all sorts of things. A couple of crickets down at the pond, somebody snapping a light switch, and shaking a front door to make sure it's locked. <laughs> it must be Mrs. Edwards. <laughs> she's always worrying about thieves and burglars. Never had anyone break in, but she's worried just the same. You hear that? It's a dog barking way off across the tracks. I suppose he's having a nightmare. Dreaming he's chasing Miss Pritchard's cat or stealing a steak from Anderson's butcher shop. There's something else stirring up sound waves, too. Faint rustle of leaves where the elm tree in the Davis front yard does a little more annual shedding, anticipating another winter. Yes, sir, if you listen close, you can hear all sorts of things while the moon's pushing up towards the stars. And from what my ears tell me, I'd say that, generally speaking, all's well with this night. I'll have to admit, though, there's a lot of sounds you can't hear, not all at once. People, mostly. 
Somewhere, somebody's crying, somebody's laughing, and somebody's saying, I love you. I suppose if a person had fine enough hearing to pick up all that he'd heard, well, <laughs> a human being's constructed to take in only one sound at a time. That's plenty, sometimes even too much. You know, they say a certain note played on a violin can break a glass, and that you can destroy a man's mind if you happen to strike the right note over and over. I expect that's true. But think what it'd mean if you could hear all the human sounds turned loose on a single night. Hear them just for a second. All the torture and the agony and the love and hate, the pleasure and the ugliness and the beauty. I don't think a person could stand it. But like I say, human beings aren't meant to hear more than one sound at a time. Unless, of course, there's an echo. Funny thing, isn't it? The way you can stand in a certain place, like over behind Oak Hill, and carry on a conversation with yourself. Oh, yes, I, I know there's a natural explanation for that. Rock formations and so on. But have you ever noticed that sounds aren't the only things that repeat themselves? Sometimes it seems to me that nearly everything in the world leaves an echo of one kind or another. A room you walked into just once. A tune you heard somebody hum. Or a face that passed you on the street and smiled. They can all reverberate somewhere back in your mind. And keep echoing over and over. I suppose there's a natural explanation for that, too, or... Maybe it's just that nothing really dies, not as long as somebody remembers it, or somebody believes in it. Now, you take the story of Germelshausen, for instance. That was the name of a town in Europe, and Friedrich Stocker wrote about it. He, he said this happened about a hundred years ago. Southern Germany was quiet and peaceful then. Little towns with tall spired churches and medieval-looking houses huddled together for warmth in the valleys beneath the pine-covered hills. Well, on this particular day, it was almost evening, when a young man came walking down the high road. He had a portfolio strapped onto his knapsack, and there was a little smear of paint on his cuff. That's the way with artists. They spend all their lives noticing how other people look, but they never seem to care much about themselves. Anyway, he didn't. He just strolled along, watching and listening. And then when he came to a twisted old willow tree, standing beside a little path that branched off the main road, he paused and took out his sketchbook. Now, you know, I suppose people had been seeing that particular tree for a good many years. They walked past it, arrested in its shade, maybe cut initials into its bark. But this was the first time anybody ever thought about echoing that willow on canvas. And about half an hour later, Arnold, that's the young man's name, had done a pretty good job of drawing it. Then all of a sudden, he heard something. He turned around and saw a pretty girl watching him. Well, as he went on with his sketch, they got to talking. You know how that is. Young girls are always intrigued by artists, and young men are always... <laughs> well, you know how that is. <laughs> anyway, the minutes went past, and maybe it was an hour later when the girl suddenly jumped up and said she had to go home, that it was time for dinner. Arnold asked her where she lived, and she answered, Germelshausen, just down there in the valley. Then she laughed softly and told him to come along with her. He could have dinner and maybe spend the evening. Well, Arnold didn't need much encouragement. He... He did mention something about intruding, but the girl replied that her father would enjoy meeting a stranger. They hardly ever came to Germelshausen. As she talked, she raised her eyes towards him. Somewhere back of the blue part, there were tears. Arnold opened his mouth to say something, but before he could speak, the girl had gathered up his paint and things, and he found himself following her down the twisted path, listening to her voice, and not hearing the words she was saying. They were at the edge of the village before he realized that he hadn't even thought to ask her name. And yet somehow, he knew that she was called Gertrude. So he decided she must have told him. But he still couldn't remember when. And afterwards, all he could remember about that walk was that her eyes were the same blue that Raphael had used in painting his Madonna. And her hair was the color of sunlight on a wheat field. And, well, uh, a lot more things like that. Oh, of course, some of them weren't true, strictly speaking. Gertrude was just a pretty girl, but to Arnold, she was the most beautiful woman who'd ever lived. And I guess that's the usual with, <laughs> with people in love. They look through rose-tinted glasses. Or is it the other folks who are walking around half-blind? Hmm? <laughs> I don't know. At any rate, Gertrude and Arnold were coming towards the village, both of them singing down deep inside. And then... The girl paused in front of a moss-covered tombstone, and the song seemed to die away on the wind. Arnold glanced at the inscription on the monument, but the lettering was so old-fashioned and faded he could barely make it out. Anna Maria Berthold died 
December 2nd, 1224. She was my mother, Gertrude said solemnly. Arno didn't understand. The woman had been dead hundreds of years. She must have been Gertrude's great-great-grandmother. The girl shook her head. No, she was my mother. Arnold bent closer to the stone. Perhaps the lettering was so weather-beaten he'd misread it. Or maybe the figure, too, was really innate. He wasn't sure. But before he'd had the chance to go over the dates again, Gertrude tugged at his arm and pulled him away. And the next thing he knew, they were walking down the main street of the village. Now, now Germel's housing was old and musty and smelled of moist earth. But Gertrude's home seemed pleasant, and her father welcomed him warmly. They ate a tremendous dinner, and then after the last glass of wine, the young painter took out his sketchbook and started the work. And Gertrude's likeness, standing in front of the broad window, which overlooked the quaint high gable town with its flat church tower, swiftly filled the page. 